The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. I'd like to uh, next welcome up uh, Kaz Benaki, the New York uh, and New Jersey Port Authority. And without further ado, please uh, welcome Kaz up here to give his talk. Well, good afternoon. Uh, again, for, your, for the, anyone in the audience who doesn't know what the Port Authority does, we, uh, we maintain and manage uh, some of the uh, major infrastructure uh, facilities in New York City, uh, the airports, uh, uh, tunnels between New York and New Jersey, and bridges. So we basically uh, uh, have uh, quite a bit of concrete that we use in our facilities, and uh, we certainly want sustainability. We don't have enough of money to do all the projects that we have. So we certainly want to make sure whatever we build, it lasts. So to me, sustainability is number one, durability. This concrete has to last, okay? When we talk about uh, uh, pavements, be it taxiways, runways, highways, we're not talking about something that we put down and in 20 years we're looking to replace it. Hopefully those pavements are down for 50 years and longer. When we talk about putting a, a new runway at JFK, that runway should be there 100 years. Uh, we talk about bridge decks for 100 years. Why don't we talk about taxiways and runways for 100 years? I don't think in my lifetime the runways at JFK are going to be moved anywhere into Manhattan. They're going to stay where they are, and the, the better they, they perform, the better off we'll all be. So to me, sustainability means durability. You know, we talk about green. Green is nice, but let's not kid each other. Green, a lot of times, is the dollar. We're all in this for profit, and many times when we talk about green, we do get some pushback. Okay, now, what I want to talk about is two major jobs that we've had. One that we've completed recently, we repaved the runway, one of the runways at JFK. It's a major runway. It was asphalt. The reason why it was changed to concrete was because the asphalt didn't last. Every 10 years or so, we had to repave it. So the managers at the airport said that, hey, we've had enough of this. Let's try to put concrete down, and let's see if this will last. And the reason why they wanted to go to concrete, we did put some concrete pavements at JFK, and they liked the performance. So the bottom line is the best way to sell concrete is it's got to perform in place. Okay, it's got to perform. If we put concrete down that needs to be repaired in one year, needs to be replaced in 20 years, nobody wants it. You could put the black stuff down and do the same thing help, you know, at a cheaper price. It's got to work. So... Uh, we replaced this runway, and it looks like we're going to be replacing another one in a couple of years with concrete. And the other job I want to talk about is rebuilding the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center is a Port Authority property. It's falling to the Port Authority to rebuild the Trade Center. And I'll go over some, some concrete work that we've done there. But first, let's talk about rebuilding 13 right, 31 left. That is a major runway at JFK. You're looking at that runway, looking north from Jamaica Bay. Here's a shot of the same runway looking west, okay? And part of that runway was not completed yet. Uh, you can see here it's still asphalt. Uh, this half was done in three months. Three months we placed 200,000 yards of concrete. This runway was shut down for three months. And again, uh, JFK is one of the busy airports, so they shut down that airport for three months. Uh, uh, you better get it right. Uh, 
we have over 35 million people that come through there, and it's one of the busiest airports for cargo. Uh, the runway is almost three miles long. 18 inches of, of, of pavement was put down, and a total of 250,000 yards of concrete. And we even threw a bone of 400,000 tons of asphalt to the asphalt industry for shoulders. That's where the asphalt belongs. Okay. Now, the criteria in the industry for runways, taxiways, is the flex test, okay, flexural strength, uh, ASTMC 78. And I think the standard now is that you have to get 650 pounds in flex strength. Uh, I don't know how we came up with 650. It used to be 750, then it went to 700, then it went to 650. So I asked, I said, how come we're down to 650? They said, well, we're having problems meeting uh, that flex strength in the country, so that's why we came up with 650. I said, well, at least you're honest. That's a good answer. Uh, but I said, you know, you know, for us to get 650 with our materials in this part of the country, I'm talking to the FAA now, okay, because we are negotiating now to change their specification for our use. We get money from the FAA, so, you know, we have to use their spec P501, which was just recently revised, okay, and updated, updated, okay. And I said, well, uh, 650 is no good for us, you know, 700 uh, maybe is a little better, but, 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 but we don't want to give any bonuses, okay. Now, the FAA spec has payment reductions. If you don't get 650, you can get payment reductions, okay. And uh, if you get above 650, then you can get bonuses. So my discussion with the FAA was to do with this. I said, look, we don't want to give anybody 6% bonus just because they meet the flexural strength requirement. How in the heck does the flexural strength really relate to the problems that we have with pavements? It really doesn't. I mean, if you get 3,000, 4,000 PSI concrete, that's probably good enough. Our pavements fall apart because there's cracking, there's spalling, the joints aren't holding up. I said, you know, if we're going to give somebody a, a, a bonus, we want, to, we want to make sure that the air, the water, and the permeability of the concrete is low. And they didn't have any problem. They didn't have much of a problem with that to this point until we said, they said, okay, that sounds good. And I said, but we're going to test for this. Oh, crap. You know, and, 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 and that's the stick in the mud, okay? We're going to test for it. And if you don't meet, and I'll show you what the requirements were, you do not get a bonus. And the argument that I got was that, hey, we have a deal with the Portland Cement Concrete Paving Association, and the deal that we have is if you get over 650 flex, we give you a bonus. So I said, well, I guess you're going to have to go tell them that there's another deal here on the table. And I'm saying to myself, I hope these guys don't negotiate with the Russians and the Chinese because we're, not, we're going to come out at the short end of the stick because 650 flex is no big deal. Okay, so here's the FAA spec. Okay, water cement ratio less than 0.45. Not a problem. In fact, that's what 318 says. Free stored durability concrete should be below 0.45. That's not a problem. We also added these two little clinkers in here, okay? We want to reduce the cementitious content, okay? We think that we don't, if the more cementitious material you have in there, and if you have a water cement ratio of 0.45, guess what? You're going to drive up the water, right? Water cement ratio is water over mass. More cement, more water. And really the problem with concrete is that the more total water you have in the mix, the more shrinkage cracking you're going to get, right? And, and again, we all know that concrete cracks. We all know that. We've learned that. Okay, but it doesn't have to crack as much as it does crack. And if we get the water down, guess what? It doesn't crack as much, all right? So we said, hey, we're going to limit the cementitious content to 550. Well, the new FAA spec says the minimum cementitious content is 564. So, you know, I'm talking to people, and they said, well, there must be some scientific basis for this. That's not like an even number. I said, the hell, it ain't an even number. I said, that's six bags of cement. I said, that's how scientific it is. And they said, nah. I said, yeah. Okay. So anyway, so when I explained this to the FAA, they said, really? I said, yeah, that's where it came from. I said, but you know, cementition, paste content is a function of aggregate size. Okay? If you've got one inch aggregate in there, 564 probably makes sense. I'm sure they even, they might even put more in that. In. So we added a few more uh, uh, requirements. Aggregate content, got to be 70% or better, or we ain't buying it. And here's the one that really gets people ticked off. Two-inch aggregate, 
must be two inches. Nominal maximum size aggregate, two inches. Why do we want that? If you start with a larger aggregate, you can reduce the paste content. Pretty damn basic and simple, okay? But what you really need to do then is you just can't take a two-inch aggregate and throw it in. You really have to now pay attention to the aggregate gradation because segregation is a big, big issue. So what they're forced to do is come up, we use this uh, costless workability factor, but you could use anything you want in our, in our jobs. The only thing we want is we want this, we want this, and we don't want segregation. Okay, if you come up with a mix that works, we'll buy it. And of course the air content, 5%, that's standard. So this is what we convinced the, uh, the FAA to buy into, and they did. They were gracious enough to buy into it, and then we tied to this that these uh, percent within limits. Uh, flexural strength over 795, and again, that's FAA requirement. Water cement ratio, less than 0.45. PWL, 80. We test concrete on a lot basis. Every day's production is a lot. So when we test our concrete, we test the concrete for water content, air content, and we also throw in this ringer rapid chloride permeability test. Why do we do that? We wanted to make sure that we're getting a supplementary cementitious material in there. If the rapid chloride permeability test does anything, it will tell you whether that material is in there. Okay? So these are the t if you don't meet these requirements, you don't get a bonus. Simple as that. And the one that's really telling is water content. Water content is really telling. We do the microwave test. Okay? Uh, Brad came up here and talked about the... Uh, uh, water reduces polycarboxylates and all it is. There's nothing cheaper than water, okay? Nothing cheaper than water. And if you don't do the microwave test, how do you know how much water you really have in the mix? There any concrete producers in the, uh, in, in the audience? How do you know? You don't know. You look at a batch ticket, okay? And then if you believe that batch ticket, that's okay. We don't, okay? We don't believe batch tickets. We test, okay? We just had an interesting uh, exercise this past week where somebody came in with doing 20,000 yards of concrete on a taxiway. They came in, submitted a mixed design, so we don't think this is going to work. Oh, yeah? Here's my testing lab. They tested it works. Good. Now go out there and prove it to us. Do a test section. Well, guess what? It didn't work. Okay? Instead of 19 ounces of a high range, they needed 47 ounces of a high range in order to get the water cement ratio between 0.4 and 0.45. So getting this is, you know, getting this water right in the mix is not a walk on a beach. Why is it important? It's important for durability. You get the water down, you get the cracking down, you get the permeability down, and you get the paste down. So it's very important. We do this test, and we also did the rapid chloride permeability test to see whether, in fact, the slag was in the mix. And we, did a, we, we, we had a modified test here for the rapid chloride. We followed what uh, Virginia DOT came up with, and that's curing the sample for seven days at 73 degrees and 21 days at 100 uh, degrees. And, it, and, of course, we did the uh, content test. Here is a shot of some of the aggregate that goes into this concrete, and this is a shot on the stockpile. Here's a pen, okay? We've got 15% of this stone in that mix, 15%. Okay, so this is not your run-of-the-mill sidewalk concrete mix, and that's what we want. Here's the, con the leading edge of some concrete uh, on that particular runaway job, and here's the pavement going down. Now, this was slipped. Most of this concrete, the contractor used slip forming in order to place it in the time frame that we got. But there was also some that was placed uh, within forms, and to be honest with you, I think the quality within the forms was much better. And here's the mix again. Uh, again, the mix was placed at about an inch and a half slump because it was slipped. And here's the con same concrete mix, no difference other than this had more high range in it, and this was being placed at a four-inch slump. Okay? You can see the, uh, uh, the, the curing membrane, the texturing, and here's a shot at a runway from afar. Here's the actual mix design. Okay, here's the mix design that was used. Cementitious content, and that was an IS cement. Okay, so slag was into ground into this, and it was an excellent, excellent cementitious material that was used. The aggregate content, and here's the high range, 30 ounces of high range. Now, this was slipped, okay, slip form concrete, one and a half inch slump, and we still use 30 ounces of a high range, okay, 30 ounces of a high range. 
If we didn't do the microwave test, what do you think we would use? How many, how many ounces do you think we would use? A little less, okay? All right. Now, here are the results. There's a couple of things I'd like to point out. Some industry misconceptions, okay? ASTM C78 is very variable, not repeatable, not a good test for, for quality control. Look at these numbers. We actually did some cylinders because we wanted to, to, to bury this once and for all. Here's the compressive strength and the companion flexural strength. The flexural strength was almost 1100 PSI. I just want to take you back a little, take you back a little. The FAA spec is 650, 650. Here's what the water cement ratio was in the field, 0 0.40. Why was it 0 0.40? Because the contractor wanted to get a bonus. Now, this didn't come off batch tickets. This is microwave 0 0.40. That's why you get these high values up here. Okay, this is not make believe. Okay, let's make believe we got 0.45 in there. This is for real. Okay, and that's the deviation. Okay, now, here's one myth. Here, look at the flexural strength data, and we have a 8.5 is coefficient of variation. The coefficient of variation for the flex test was less than for C39 for this whole job. Okay, so there goes that story that you can't use C78 for acceptance or for quality control. It's too variable. What happened here? How come, how come we got better, a better coefficient of variation for the flex test than we did for cylinders? Here's another myth. The microwave test doesn't work. It's too variable. Well, how in the hell did he make it work? Okay? 0.40, oh, and he did the job. Here's another myth. Coulombs. That's another test that doesn't work. Okay, too variable. Can't do anything. With that modified test, he averaged 700 coulombs. The standard deviation was 130. Why doesn't that work? You look at the data that we got here for this runway, this is better concrete data than most people get on bridge decks. Now, a bridge decks can last almost 100 years. At least that's what we tell people. I don't know what the hell they really at last. This should last the same, okay? This concrete pavement was not made to last 20 years. This concrete pavement was made to last 50 to 100 years, okay? So I think this data shows that we've set the bar too low in the industry. With the chemical admixtures we have out there, if we just do our work right, we can get better quality concrete. And there's another ringer that we introduced into the spec. If the concrete cracks before we load it, it's yours. Take it out. There were 6,000 slabs that were placed on this job. 6,000 slabs, 30 somewhat slabs were removed. Here's another buyout that we had to get from the FAA. The standard in the industry is slabs are 20 by 20, correct? So we went to tell them, guess what? We're using 25 by 25. They said, oh, no, 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 no. We're looking to go to 18 feet because we're getting a lot of cracking. Well, I said, no, we're sticking with the 25. If you don't want to buy that, come out to our facilities and take a look how many cracks we have. But we are not going to 20 by 20. The, the, the tighter the joint spacing, the lower the joint spacing, the more costly the pavement. Every joint requires dowels, low transfer dowels, okay? Every joint is a potential maintenance problem. So the further apart we have the joints, the better off we are. We're looking at going to 30-foot space. Okay, so we're going to have to break that today, I figure, one of these days. Okay. Now, I said we set the bar too low. Look what this contractor did. Okay, again, we award bonuses or payment reductions on a lot basis. There wasn't one lot that they got a payment reduction on. And 83% of the lots, they got a bonus. The contractor bonus, $1.1 million. Okay, even with all those additional uh, requirements we put on the contractor, they did it. Why then do we have such a requirement in the country where you're going to get a bonus if you only get 650 flex, I think needs to be asked, because that's not much of a standard. Okay, rebuilding the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center belongs to the Port Authority, okay? Unfortunately, we all know what happened there on 9-11. I'm showing you a shot from the west side of the World Trade Center. This photo was taken from the World Finance Center, which is just west of the World Trade Center. What you're looking at here, these are the original footprints of the two towers. This is the North Tower, the South Tower. This is Tower 1 going up. This is Tower 4 going up. This is Tower 3 and Tower 2. The other thing I want to show you, 
there was some major, there's major construction below grade here that you can't see. There's going to be a major mall here below grade. There's a subway that goes through here right along Greenwich Street, okay? That, sub, that subway had to be resupported in order to be able to allow people to move from one side of this site to the other. And I just want to show you, I point that out because there was, uh, we really had to use some uh, self-consolidated concrete to the nth degree in order to get this job done, and I'm going to show you that mix design. But this is the 1-9 subway line where we had to reconstruct the support system for this subway in order to allow this wall to cross the street here. Here are the, here are the two memorials, for, here are the two footprints for the two towers. This is already done. Uh, it was opened up on 9-11 of this past year, uh, the Cascading Waterfalls. This is the pavilion for the memorial. Uh, this is looking at uh, uh, the names that are enshrined along those pools. Here's the look at the tower. Here's, here's Tower 1. Tower 1 now is approximately at elevation 1,200. It's 1,200 feet up in the air. Okay, here are the requirements for the concrete, uh, for the uh, core. Now, this has a concrete core top to bottom. The bottom was 14,000, 12,000, with the, uh, with, and, and modulus of elasticity was 7 million. A 7 million is not exactly a walk on the beach, uh, but we, did, we were able to achieve that. Here are some of the quantities of material that are in that tower. There's 215,000 yards of concrete in that tower, 470,000 tons of steel, and 46,000 tons of rebar. Basically, what the tower consists of, the, here, is, here, is, here is the uh, uh, artist's rendering of the tower. It's an octagon in shape, okay? And the tower itself is going to, is, is 1,300 and, uh, uh, 13,000 uh, feet, uh, it's 1,300 feet, and the, uh, the antenna is another 400 feet. Total tower height is 1,776. Now, the tower is constructed with a concrete core and with a steel frame on the outside, okay? And again, the concrete core is to house the elevators and, and the uh, egress from the tower in the event of an emergency. You can see that the uh, steel is rather robust. Here's a W14730. Uh, That's 730 pounds per foot. So the steel frame on the outside is quite robust. Here's the concrete core. These are the uh, walls on the inside, uh, the thickness of the walls. And on the outside, the, uh, here's the north, north and south walls, 48 inches. Actually, it doesn't show you the walls below grade. Below grade, the walls, these walls were 4 foot 10 inches. And you can see uh, they're pretty thick going all the way up. And these are the east-west walls, 36, 30 inches. And here's the uh, schematic on what the tower looks like. It's 70 feet below grade. Uh, uh, that is, the uh, basement is 70 feet below grade. And you can see this is the office area. We're up to here now. We're up to 1,200. The tower tops out at, 60, at, at 1,368. And then there's a 400-foot antenna that goes up there. There's going to be an observation deck, restaurant, and all of this is office space. OK, here's the mix design that we use for the 14,000 PSI uh, concrete uh, that uh, I guess Brad showed. Uh, but this was the second mix. We actually had a mix before this, so there was another concrete supplier. And then there was some kind of a mishap in the business relationship between the concrete producer and the concrete supplier, uh, so it was changed. Notice the total uh, cementitious content here. Now, this is quaternary mix. We have cement, fly ash, slag, silica fume, 925. Notice there's 300 pounds of cement in here. Okay, I'll confess to you that we did not restrict the, the, the cement because of green considerations. Okay, we restricted the cement content because our concern of temperature in place. When we inherited this project, the foundations were already awarded. Once the foundations were awarded, the developer said to the Port Authority, I'm not building this building, goodbye. And the governor said, I guess you guys got to build it now. Go ahead. So anyway, when we got the mix designs for the, for the 12,000 PSI concrete that was being used for the foundations, they had 700 pounds of cement and 100 pounds of silica fume, total cementitious content, 1250. Tim, I'd like you to do a heat curve on that one for me. So anyway, when we looked at this, we said, this, this is crazy. How could we do this? So when we went ahead and we put together the, uh, the uh, concrete specification for the tower, we said maximum temperature in place in the core, 160, delta T, 35. That's how we came up 
with 300 pounds of cement. Okay, so it had nothing to do with environmental consideration. But I think the point to be made here is that green concrete, okay, is technically also, could be technically also good concrete, okay? So you don't need to have green concrete and sacrifice anything. We've got great quality here, and, we, and, and you know, I'm not here to, to bash cement. I'm just saying that we should be aware of that the cements of today do hydrate rather quickly. At least that's what we found with the cements that we have downtown. And they, almost every one of them peaked in temperature in the forms in 24 hours. And to get a temperature in the forms of 180 degrees was not unusual. 180 degrees. You should keep that in mind, okay, because the cylinders are cured at 78 degrees tops. So if somebody could educate me later on, how does 78 degree cylinder relate to 180 degree, 150 degree concrete in place, I'd like to know that story because the probability is the two are not related, okay? All right, so anyway, here's the mix design, and look, we certainly put in a lot of ad mixtures here. High range water, hydration retarder, and defoaming agent. You know what we found? Even with 300 pounds of cement, that we lost workability. We, and, and the reason for that is the water cement ratio is rather low. Not that we ever got 0.24, that's another joke. That's nice in the lab, but it doesn't work in the field. Okay, but we needed to put in a hydration retarder to slow down the hydration, even with 300 pounds of cement, because the workability was horrendous. Okay, so that's why the hydration retard is in there. Now, when this guy got on board, here's what he first averaged, 14,000, 14, 14. And again, we have a specification where we have end result and we have payment adjustments. We awarded this guy 50% payment, of course, the country. We said, by the way, our spec does not mean average of 14,000. It means we want 14,000 every day, and we didn't get it. But then uh, when, when things got rolling, he actually got to 16,000, okay? And he's doing a marvelous job, great job. Okay, I just want to show you here. Uh, here's the concrete. Here we go. Oh, here we go. That's that 14,000 PSI concrete in the forms. Okay, it's self-consolidating concrete. What's the slump on this? I mean, we love the slump test. There ain't, you know, you can't measure the slump on this. But look, at it. it's moving like a river. Okay, this is self-consolidating concrete, and it worked very good. Okay, and another mix that we have now, 10,000 PSI. This concrete is being now pumped 1,200 feet, okay? And again, the cement content here is about 950. And again, high-range water reducer, hydration retarder in it, again, for the same reason. And the strengths are very good, okay? We don't have much of a problem getting high-strength concrete. Again, this is not something that you get up in the morning, you put these numbers together. There was a big effort involved where, you know, we got the concrete producer, we tested, we worked, we tested. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't just happen with a lot of wishful thinking. You've got to do a little work. Okay, here's a view from my corner office up there, uh, like hell. But anyway, you can see here, this is, from, this is from Tower One. There's the Verrazano. Here's New York Harbor. There's the Statue of Liberty. Uh, I just want to sh share with you this invert pour, which again was a complicated pour. We elevated the subway, temporarily supported it, and now we had to pour an invert slab below it, 30 inches thick, had to be filled, uh, uh, and again, you couldn't get to it, so it had to be self-consolidating concrete, and the concrete had to go to the bottom of the invert. We actually had a summer mix where we actually took out another 100 pounds of cement. Why? Because we found that we were losing the workability, and we took out another 100 pounds of cement, we got better workability. That was the only reason why we did it. Here were the results, 8,000 PSI concrete, obviously we blew it away. Look at the water cement ratio. Imagine getting 12,000 PSI concrete, a 0.4 water cement ratio. Okay, here's this slab that we poured. Okay, that's, the, and above that is the subway, okay? And I just want to share with you this video. Here is a, if you could see it. Okay, there's a, there were cameras embedded in these forms. This is 30 inches of concrete, okay? And here's the concrete coming in, self-consolidating concrete, okay? And we had these cameras in here just to see how are we doing. Are we getting the concrete up to the invert? Uh, are we getting good filling in there? Again, no vibration. Here's the concrete moving in, okay, in real time. Uh, and again, this didn't happen by accident. We did a lot of test pours in order to get this to where we wanted it, all right? And it turned out very, very good. Okay, thank you very much.